The Lord be with you. It is so good to see your glasses and masks. <laughs> we do have uh, just a few announcements I want to make sure you are aware of. So first off, if as you made your way in, if you did not get a bag or a bulletin especially, uh, the bulletins are inside of the bags. But if you didn't get a bag or a bulletin, if you'll please raise your hand and we'll make sure that one gets to you, okay? Um, if you raise your hand, just keep it up for a moment so that we can get that to you. We are so excited to be back together and excited to be uh, starting with Easter morning of being able to be outdoors together for worship each week. Uh, it's, you know, who would have thought a year ago this would be a year. So it is delightful to uh, see you, to be with you, and to uh, be encouraged by each other's presence this Easter morning. The service will be approximately 35 minutes today. We do have the restrooms to Laird Hall open, but we ask that you only utilize that if it's an emergency. Uh, there are a number of protocols we do need to follow for that, so please only use the restrooms if it is an emergency. Uh, we also ask that you sanitize. We have a couple sanitize stations as you make your way in. Uh, if you need to, please wear a mask. I know that many of you are vaccinated, uh, but many of us still are not. And we are a community together and we will continue to look out for each other uh, and to care for those who are still vulnerable. So please continue to wear your masks. And then lastly, as we transition to weekly worship outdoors, if you, if you do wake up and you're not feeling well, we would ask that you please stay home and uh, then join us again when you are feeling better. Okay. Uh, we will still be posting, if that does happen, the church online services. Uh, we hope to have them up by about 1 p.m. on Sundays each week. It'll be a recording of this service. Uh, I will remind you about this on your way out, but as you leave today, we do have uh, bags for the kids. Uh, Miss Megan has made these, and we know that it's, it's a different kind of Easter. At a lot of the events that you typically attend, are not being offered this year. And so we have a whole bunch, I mean a whole bunch of these baskets. And I want to invite you to take some uh, for friends, for neighbors. If you have people around you with kids and you think that they would enjoy it, feel free to grab one or two or three uh, and to share them with those around uh, where you live, okay? So I'll remind you about that, but they'll be over on a table. Uh, the way you came in, they'll be on a table as you leave. And we have 50 of them. So that means if you have someone you can give it to, please share it with them, all right? So uh, I invite you to consider that. We are delighted to have uh, our special guest, the Brass uh, Quartet with us today. So thank you all so much. We are grateful for the music that you're sharing and the way that it adds to our celebration. So thank you so much for being here. And with that, I want to invite us now to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship as we quiet ourselves and hear that Jesus Christ is risen today.
As you are able, I want to invite you to stand and please join me in our call to worship. It is printed in your bulletins. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the good news we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved. That Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again on the third day. He appeared to Peter and to the twelve and to many faithful witnesses. At last he came to us that we might come to believe and proclaim this good news to the world. I invite you to be seated. As we hear our hymn, uh, Jared will be singing, and I invite you to hum joyfully along. <laughs> Wow. 
We live in a world that uses the word God, the name God, in all sorts of ways. And when we as Christians speak of God, we are telling a particular story. And when we confess the creed together, we are reminding ourselves of that core story, the essential seed of our faith. It's this seed that by the grace of God grows in so many ways and blossoms in so many ways. And so at this time, let us confess together the faith in which we were baptized. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now as we prepare to turn our hearts and minds to hear the scriptures, let us pray. Uh, first of all, you all pray for me, and let us pray for each other that we might hear well. Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, and prepare my heart to accept your word, Silence in me any voice but your own, that hearing I may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture today is taken from the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Again, it's the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. If you have your Bible with you and you want to open up, I invite you to do so. If you're using an app, you can pull the reading up. Uh, to follow along. I invite you to listen now to the word of the Lord and for God's word to you today. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Mary stood outside near the tomb crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? 
Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said, don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Then she told them what he said to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is such a great text. I would love to have about 45 minutes this morning. (laughs) But I'll try not to. (laughs) Our scripture starts out, the story starts when it is still dark. Mary is making her way to the tomb, and you can use your imagination, and you can picture the scene. She's making her way, and and it's so dark that if she holds her hand out in front of her, she can't really quite make it out. It's so dark that, that she's slowly making her way. She's watching her step so that she doesn't stumble as she makes her way along. And as I hear this story, I don't think she had a light. I don't think she brought a lantern. I don't think she carried a candle. And in fact, I think if someone had offered her, if someone had come along and said, Mary, here's a light, she would have said, no, thank you. I don't want that, that light. She made her way in the dark, and as I hear this story, I think that the darkness probably fit where her spirit was living. I mean, she was living through a moment where all the relational structures that she depended on had failed. All the relational structures that we as human beings depend upon for life had failed. She was living in the darkness. I think the darkness in her spirit matched the darkness that she picked her way through. Have you ever been at that place in your life where you were living in the darkness and you didn't want anybody to offer you the light? If somebody had started singing Pharrell Williams, I was happy, right? You would have been like, please stop. Not now. My spirit cannot handle that right now. That's not where I'm at. Don't sing songs like that to me. Have you ever been in that place? There's so many ways that we can relate, I think, to the darkness, but it's, it's worth hanging in and seeing the particular darkness that Mary was living through. I mean, imagine, you know, we, we hear this story year after year. We know how it goes, but Mary, she's three days into her world falling apart. Think of all the ways that her world had come crumbling down. I mean, she had a group of friends and they were like family and they were centered around Jesus and who they understood Jesus to be. And that whole family had come apart. A few years ago, Vanessa and I received from some friends some great glasses. They had a saying on them. It said this, here's to the nights that become mornings with the friends who become family. That was great. That that was the family that Mary had, this family that was centered around Jesus. And that whole family had come undone because one of those family members had betrayed Jesus for some pocket change. Another one of those family members, one of the closest family members, had denied Jesus, not just once, but three times. All of those family members who had been with Jesus when he was arrested had abandoned him, had run to get away to save their own skin. That family that she was a part of, that family that anchored her, had come apart completely. And she couldn't lean on those systems. Where do you turn when your family falls apart? A lot of people turn to faith when their family falls apart. Mary couldn't turn to her faith because her faith had betrayed Jesus also. The very religious leaders who should have been standing up for justice, who should have been speaking out, were instead the very people who had helped to betray Jesus. They had set up a kangaroo court to try Jesus. They had been a part of seeing that he was seized. They had set up false witnesses. The very religious people, the people of faith that you might want to turn to, they couldn't be counted on. That whole relational system had failed. But where do you turn when your family falls apart, when your faith community falls apart? I mean, at least you can count on an impartial system of justice, right? But Mary couldn't count on that because the justice system 
had killed Jesus. Jesus had been caught up like an insignificant pawn in these systems and power plays between Rome and an occupying empire and the Jewish community. They had no qualms about killing Jesus for all of Pontius Pilate's protest, right? For all the ways he said, I don't find anything against Jesus. He didn't have any problem with turning him over to be killed. In fact, I think by lunch, Pontius Pilate wasn't giving Jesus another thought. It's just another dead Jewish guy. Who cared? Where do you turn when your family falls apart, when your faith community falls apart, when your system of justice, your government falls apart? Or at least you can turn to God himself in prayer. But Mary had heard Jesus, the man who, who she thought was closer to God than anybody she'd ever met. She'd heard him cry out. His own voice had said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't imagine Mary prayed very much on Friday. I don't imagine she spent much time in prayer on Saturday. I don't imagine if she couldn't sleep in the early hours of, of that Sunday morning as she got up and decided to make her way in the dark. I don't imagine she was doing much praying. All of the, the relational systems that we depend on as human beings had failed her and come apart. Mary made her way to the tomb in the darkness. And it's as she arrived... And only as she arrived that I think she suddenly wished she had a light with her. Because as she arrived, she found that the tomb was opened up. The stone that should have been covering it, that should have secured Jesus' body, had been rolled away. Now here's the thing. Grave robbing, it was an issue in this day. So much of an issue that Rome enacted an edict that if you robbed a grave, you would do capital punishment. It was a capital offense to rob a grave. So you can imagine as Mary arrives and discovers that the stone's been rolled away, that she's thinking the worst. I mean, my goodness, indignity upon indignity. Now his body's missing. So she does the only thing she knows to do. She has no light to figure out what's going on. So she runs back and she tells Peter and she tells the uh, John, the, the disciple John, his body's missing. And she announces the question that has been hanging over the world ever since. If you take the Christian claim seriously, she asked the question that has been hovering over the world ever since. They've taken his body, and I don't know where to find him. We'll come back to that. Peter and John take off to the tomb. They're running in the darkness. Picture that. Use your imagination again. Picture them running in the darkness. They want to get there as fast as they can, but it's still so dark and they can't see. And they're trying. I imagine they had a lot of bruised knees and scuffles from falling on the way. And we get this weird interchange throughout where John, the writer, wants us to know that he's faster than Peter. I mean, Peter, Peter might be first, but he's slow. There's something not so subtle there, right? You might be first, Peter, but... We see this whole scene unfold as they race their way. I think falling continually, they arrive at the tomb and they discover that it's just like Mary had said. And here's what John does. And this is beautiful. As they arrive at the tomb, as they arrive at the tomb, as Peter and John arrive at the tomb in the darkness, the sun begins to rise in our scripture. And it starts out this way. The beloved disciple, he arrives and he looks in and he sees the grave clothes lying there. Well, that's weird. Well, that's, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you were a soldier and you were showing up to just desecrate a body, why would you take the time to unwrap it? And if you were a grave robber and you were showing up to steal something of value, why would you take a body and why would you unwrap it? The light begins to shine. It's been deep darkness. The sky has been black, but now it's changing color in the text as, as we find out that these wrappings, that the, the grave clothes are lying where the body should have been. And, and then Peter eventually catches up and he looks in, he goes in and he discovers something else. Not only are the grave clothes there, uh, but there's the face cloth. And it's laying in its own place. But not only that, it's been folded up. 
What sense do you make of that? It's been folded up almost like somebody didn't need it anymore. It's been folded up and set aside. And then the other disciple makes his way in and he sees. And you can imagine John and Peter standing there taking in this scene. And then we get this beautiful statement. Right? It's a beloved disciple. It says that he went in and he looked and then he believed. But that's for you. Because what did he believe? I mean, it lingers as a question. It's fascinating that the writer immediately follows it up with this. They didn't yet understand that Jesus must, that's the way it's written, had to rise from the dead. They didn't understand that part of the scriptures. He believed, but they didn't yet understand. He believed, but they didn't yet understand. It leaves this question, what did he believe? What did he come to see? What was starting to rise in his mind? What was he starting to make sense out of? Just let that question stay with you. The two disciples... They don't know what to make of it exactly, so they go back. The way the Greek's written is they go to their own. Whatever that means, they go to their own. Their own people, their own expectations, their own homes. They go to their own. It's at that point that we're reintroduced to Mary. Mary, who plays such a pivotal role in all the gospel stories, Mary, the one who encounters Jesus first, Mary stands outside the tomb crying, weeping, still trying to make sense out of what is happening. And at some point, she decides to look into the tomb, and the story gets weird. How else do you talk about it? The story gets strange. She looks into the tomb, and now not only are there grave clothes, and not only is there a folded face cloth, but now there are two angels. And the two angels ask her, woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And the most strange thing about this is she has a very casual conversation with these two angels in a tomb. She doesn't say, oh my goodness, angels. She doesn't get scared. She doesn't fall down in fear. Instead, she just asks a question. They've taken my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. Do you hear the distress that even the sight of angels... It's just, they've taken my Lord. His body's missing. She can't get her mind away from that. Nothing else is is sort of getting through the place that her heart is in, which is just that there ought to be a body and his body's missing. And the only way I can care for him is to love his body. It's all we've got left is this body. It's all we have and it's missing and we don't know what to do. As soon as she has this thought, as soon as she says this to the angels, she becomes aware of a presence behind her, and it just gets stranger. I mean, then she she turns around, and it's Jesus, but she doesn't know it's Jesus. And we get this common thread that begins to run through all the resurrection encounters, that there's something remarkable here, that Jesus' body, his body is alive again. His body is alive. I mean, that's the way this text lets the sun rise. The grave clothes are there. You remember earlier in John, Lazarus died. Jesus went and he called Lazarus out of the tomb. And Lazarus came out of the tomb, but he came out of the tomb all wrapped up. He came out of the tomb and the grave clothes are still all around him because it's that kind of a body. It's, you know, you pinch yourself. It's that kind of a body. It needs the grave clothes still. Maybe to hold back the stench. But here, Jesus, his body is raised up. This isn't just spiritual. His body is raised up. His body's not in the tomb. His body's missing. His body's behind Mary. His body's asking, woman, who are you looking for? His body's speaking. And at the very same time, his body is such that she still has no idea who is talking to her. Maybe it's grief. But I think it's more than that. If we look at all the stories of encounter of the resurrection, it's more than that. There's a sense that people can walk a whole day's journey with Jesus. Consider that, the road to Emmaus. People can walk an entire day's journey with Jesus. People who knew Jesus can walk with Jesus. Like right here, walk with Jesus. Like, hey, let's go get some ice cream, walk with Jesus. Let's go to the movies, walk with Jesus. They can spend an entire day walking with Jesus and have no idea it's Jesus. They spend an entire day and don't know it's Jesus. Mary's in that place where Jesus is behind her and he's saying, who are you looking for? And she thinks maybe it's the gardener. So she asks this question again, the question that lingers, 
they've taken my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. They've taken my Lord. And it's the most beautiful scene because at that point, at that point, Jesus says, Mary. You almost can imagine him like right at a Halloween party, like taking his mask off. You're like, Mary, it's me. Mary, Mary, it's me. And in that moment, she knows who he is and she falls at his feet. The other gospel tells she falls at his feet and she lays hold of him. She's so overjoyed, right? Her mind has not caught up to what her heart knows. She's not thinking about the challenges and the perplexities. She's not trying to figure it out. She just knows when she heard her name called, when her name came off the lips of Jesus, she knew that her resurrected Lord was in front of her and she fell at his feet and laid hold of him. And he said, Mary, don't hold on to me yet. It's this remarkably puzzling scene, right? Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus said, I get it, go ahead and hold on a while. Like, it's good to see you too. But Jesus doesn't. He says, don't hold on to me. and Don't seize me that way. I haven't yet ascended to my father. Go and tell my brothers and sisters, go and tell the disciples, I'm ascending to my God. And Jesus says something remarkable. And, when, and as he says this, the sun is full in the sky in our scriptures. And, and, and John is leaving us with everything he wants us to contemplate. Jesus says this, I'm going to my God and your God. Tell them I'm going to my God and your God. Tell them I'm going to my father and your father. Here's the beautiful thing about this. Jesus reveals the answer to the question. The question is, they've taken my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. The remarkable answer is it turns out that who is they? They is God. God has taken Jesus. God has lifted up Jesus. Jesus has risen up from the grave and he is ascending to his father. And he says the most remarkable thing. I'm ascending to my father and your father, my God and your. And there's so much in that and your. There would be very little good news of the gospel, I think, if Jesus just said, I'm ascending to my God and my father and left it at that but he doesn't. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, in all of his mystery, the resurrected Jesus says, I'm ascending to my God and your God. The resurrected Jesus, as he rises up, he tells us, I've got hold of you. I've got hold of you. The resurrected Jesus says to Mary, says to the disciples, says to us, I've got hold of you my father and your father, my God and your God. As we celebrate the resurrection this morning, we celebrate a mystery that that reaches beyond what we can comprehend. And John leaves us with these truths. John is trying to tell the story. He's not trying to make all the dots fit because how can it? How can we completely comprehend the mystery of what has taken place? But Jesus tells us, and John wants us to know, Jesus is ascending, the resurrected Jesus, to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Friends, as we consider this Easter, as we celebrate, may we ponder the mystery of what God has done for us, the mystery captured in Jesus saying, I am ascending to my God and your God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we consider the beautiful thing that God has done for our salvation, we also must consider the truth that all of us contribute to the darkness of this world. All of us contribute to the the breakdown of all the relational systems upon which we all depend. Our family, our faith communities, our government. So let us confess our sins, confident that the risen Lord Jesus is not through with us, that he still got hold of us, and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is still shaping us. Confident of this, let us confess our sins together. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, 
bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Let us take a moment now for silent confession. Lord, remind us of your mercy. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Beloved of God, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sin in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to God. Remember, friends, the promise of your baptism sealed by the Holy Spirit and know that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven and let all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy my 
my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. As Jesus called Mary's name, so he calls through the voice of his church and speaks your name and invites you to come and follow him and to gather at the table that he has prepared in the world, the table for his family, the table that he establishes. You know, when we eat, we pray, we give thanks, we say a prayer before meals. As we gather around this table, we do the same thing. This great table requires a prayer also. And in the prayer we're about to pray, it's called just that. It's the great thanksgiving. The great thanksgiving for the table of Jesus. Friends, please join me in prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Your hand formed us from the dust of the earth and set us among all your creatures, holy God, to love and serve you. When we were unfaithful to you, you kept faith with us. Therefore, in praise, we join our voices with the heavenly choirs and the faithful of every time and place who say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power, he broke free from the prison of the tomb and at his command, the gates of hell were opened. The one who was dead now lives. Therefore, as we await the day of his coming, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Let us join together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We remember with thanksgiving our Lord's Passover meal shared with his closest friends in which he took the bread and blessed it, broke it open and gave it to them saying, this is my body. Take and eat it, remembering me. And we remember how he took a cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. 
Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, Jesus Christ is the true bread that came down from heaven and gives life to the world. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And when we drink the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Beloved of God, these are holy gifts for holy people. Yet who is holy? Come then, in Jesus Christ, everything is made ready. I invite you to take from your bags, if you've not already done so, your communion cups. And as you are able, I invite you to take uh, the bread, the side off with the bread, and to take the bread when you are ready as a sign of your individual faith in Christ. And then I invite you to take uh, the, the top off the juice side and to hold it, and we will take the juice together as a sign of our unity in Christ. Friends, the blood of Christ shed for the redemption of all creation. Please join me in prayer. Living Christ, as you open the scriptures, you make yourself known to us. And in the breaking of bread, you make yourself known to us. Let us now go forth from this place fed at your table, and may we be full by your Spirit and walk with you all the days of our lives. Having shared in Christ at your table, may we be one body, companions together on the journey. And may we proclaim in word and deed the glory of your resurrection to all the world. In Christ we pray. Amen. As you leave at the close of the service, I encourage you to remember the kids' activity bags. Friends, Jesus Christ is risen. Yeah. We could do better. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is risen. Beloved of God, Jesus Christ is risen. I invite you to stand together and to say with me our litany that is our charge. Beloved of God, who is Christ's body in the world? Where are the eyes that belong to Christ? Where are the feet that belong to Christ? Where are the hands that belong to Christ? Where is the mind that belongs to Christ? Where is the heart that belongs to Christ? Church of Christ, body of Christ in the world, go, you are sent. And as you go, receive the blessing. May the triune God go behind you to encourage you. 
beside you to befriend you in obedient ministry, above you to watch over you, beneath you to uphold you, within you to give you faith, hope, and love, and before you to show you the way. And let all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen. The Lord be with you.